morning, everyone. We give folks time to come in before we get started. Good morning. We're going to get folks. Uh, okay. It is now 9 02. Um, good morning, everyone. And I, I, I want to. Uh, I, I was sharing earlier that I, I'm very excited about uh, today. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a tremendous opportunity for uh, uh, the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce and uh, uh, our committee. So good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce uh, Business and Economic Equity Committee uh, panel discussion today um, is the possible. Uh, I want to uh, first uh, sort of just give an overview of what this uh, what this panel discussion uh, will be about this morning, as well as introduce our panelists and then our moderator. Uh, given what the pandemic has has exposed about our business communities, limitations and vulnerabilities, how do we move towards what is possible? You know, as we drive towards inclusive capitalism, a, a term that I often uh, use. For all businesses and communities, your, your voices and perspectives need to be heard by the businesses that each of you represent, their customers and the communities in which they are situated. In today's event, the Chamber President Panel Series, we will dive into topics discussing uh, the possible for the business community coming out of the pandemic and into this new normal. Uh, today, we're, we're honored uh, to have uh, three uh, chamber presidents uh, joining us um, as part of this discussion. Um, the first, uh, uh, Regina Harrison, president of the African American Chamber of Commerce of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, Trish McFarland, president, uh, Delaware County uh, Chamber of, of Commerce, president. And Jennifer Rodriguez, president and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And to, to moderate today's uh, panel discussion uh, is a, a former colleague, uh, another uh, healthcare executive, uh, Karen Dale. She is the Chief Diversity Officer, uh, Equity and Inclusion Officer for AmeriHealth Caritas Family of Companies. Uh, but Karen is also uh, a market president uh, for AmeriHealth Caritas in the DC uh, District of Columbia market. So, uh, we're, we're very excited to have these four uh, executives, these four presidents uh, this morning talk about what is possible coming out of the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So Karen, uh, I'm gonna stop talking and, and turn this over to you. But before we do that, I, I do wanna acknowledge uh, Boeing uh, as our sponsor uh, this morning uh, for, this, uh, for this event. But Karen, thank you very much and I I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. You know, I was thinking about what would kind of inspire us this morning. One of my favorite uh, books is The Hill We Climb, the inaugural poem from Amanda Gorham, Gorman. And she says the following, when day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I begin every day with gratitude. 
And this morning, I'm particularly grateful for the three presidents. I'm loving that it's three women. I'm just going to be honest, <laughs> right? Um, that are fierce advocates, strategists, and allies for diverse businesses. They see the possible. They're always working towards it. And I can't wait to have this discussion with them this morning. So welcome and thank you for being here and thank you for your leadership. So let's jump in. My first question is for us to start talking about your chambers, um, the people you serve, just kind of giving us a, a brief overview so that we're grounded. Let's begin with Trish. Thank you so much, Karen. Good morning, everybody. So the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce is made up of 1,200 members, roughly. Uh, we're a mix of the um, county's largest corporations to the smallest startups. We offer a variety of events trying to meet the needs of all of our members through connection, education, and advocacy. But we really have, um, we really try our best to be all things to all of the businesses here in Delaware County. So, uh, and very inclusive when we, we try to do that. Thank you. Regina, please tell us about your chamber. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us today for this discussion. I'm extremely excited to be here. First and foremost, we promote the value and the voice of Black business ownership here in the region. The African American Chamber of Commerce was formed in 1993 in response to a legal challenge by Contractors Association in the city of Philadelphia and they were feeling discriminated against in city contracting. And then in 2004, the foundation was formed to provide programming to remove barriers to black businesses, startup and growth. We're a membership organization comprised of individuals, small businesses, corporations, and nonprofits that are committed to the economic growth and development of black businesses here in the region. We serve small businesses that range from an annual, annual revenue of 6.8 million to entrepreneurs just launching their businesses for the first time. We collaborate with corporations and governments to diversify supply chain and contracting by connecting our members directly to opportunities and decision makers. We empower our members through advocacy, access to capital, and access to information and networks. Thank you. And Jennifer, please tell us about your chamber. Good morning, buenos dias, and Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month for those um, out in the audience that celebrate this month. The Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of, in, in Greater Philadelphia was established about 31 years ago uh, to support the economic development um, and, the, and commerce in the Latino community um, while encouraging um, the wealth creation in the overall community. Um, we are a membership organization and focus on education because um, one of the challenges that we have in the Latino community is the scaling of businesses. While Latinos are the most entrepreneurial demographic in the country, um, our businesses start smaller and remain smaller even as they mature. And in Philadelphia, unfortunately, our challenge is significant. Um, entrepreneurship in the Philadelphia region is not really what it should be. Uh, we don't rate as well as other regions nationally. Um, and in Philadelphia, only 4% of Latino businesses have paid employees. So that is a statistic that is very much at the forefront of the work that we do. We want to ensure that Latino entrepreneurs can scale and can uh, maximize the potential for growth in the economy. Thank you. So as Vince mentioned, the pandemic has exposed a lot of things um, and had in some ways an impact, a more detrimental impact on small business. So I'd love for you to share what initiatives you've introduced to offer resources and opportunities for your membership during the pandemic. If you want to highlight what's your best example, that would be awesome. Um, I'll start with Regina. 
Sure. So first, I'd like to say Black America was in an economic crisis before the pandemic. There were pre-existence that pre-existing conditions that existed that kept limited wealth creation in our businesses. Um, black income and wealth disparities, low revenue generating businesses, although Black entrepreneurship was on the rise pre-pandemic, um, challenges to access the capital, and systematic racism. So what we focused on is partnering with organizations, corporations that are building the ecosystem <clears throat> for our small businesses. There are numerous examples that I can give, but I wanna start with intentionality. So there was a report um, that came out, a marketing poll in June of this year that found 44% of total respondents said they worked harder to shop small businesses. Um, during the pandemic and currently. And 31% said they purchased more from minority owned businesses locally. And of those respondents, African American consumers were the most likely to report having done so intentionally. And so we've worked with our corporate partners to ensure that we're creating opportunities for our small businesses. One such, one such corporate partner that I'm super proud of is 6ABC. 6ABC came in and said they wanted to have more visibility for our members. And so they provided their media assets. And so we highlight our businesses on 6ABC, 6ABC channels in their streaming applications to drive more businesses to our members that are being spotlighted. They also are committed to the capacity building of the chamber itself so we can actually reach more members and strengthen our ability to stand up more businesses and create a stronger foundation. We're currently working with 6ABC on other initiatives that's going to allow the chamber to grow as well as the businesses that we're spotlighting. That's just one um, example that I can give, but there's numerous examples. We worked with the 76ers, especially during um, the onset of COVID, making sure that our businesses had information about PPP. They have a huge platform and we had an SBA uh, webinar that covered, we had over 700 members and black businesses from around the country that joined us on that webinar. So we've been able to increase our reach by the different partnerships that we have. Thank you, great information there. Uh, Jennifer, please share about what things you, you've done or if you wanna highlight an example. Sure. So very early on in the pandemic, we realized that Latino businesses were going to be severely and disproportionately impacted um, because the majority of Latino owned businesses are what we call uh, business to consumer B2C businesses. They they're front facing. And these, of course, have, as we have learned, these have been, these have been disproportionately um, impacted by the pandemic. Um, so very early on, we uh, we, we said, what is it that we can do for the food and hospitality uh, industry that is just was being decimated back in April and March of, 20, uh, of 2020? And um, we created a campaign called uh, Dine Latino Takeout Weekend. And it was all about highlighting um, Latino owned restaurants that were available for takeout and, and delivery. Because if you recall at that time, we couldn't go inside the dining rooms. Um, and Latino businesses at that time, many of them, mom and pop shop, immigrant owned businesses did not have access to the online platforms that are so popular right now. So we have moved beyond that. That program became Dine Latino Restaurant Week, which is now taking place. To, uh, today is the second day. Um, we have, and that has become a permanent fixture in our um, in our calendar of activities. In fact, Dine Latino Restaurant Week has grown to about close to over two dozen restaurants participate in it um, this week. Um, so, so that was the first initiative, the first thing that we did right out of the box back in April. Um, and we, we got together internally and said, we need to pivot. And we created what we call the Recalibrate, Retool, Restart 
campaign and it was all about helping Latino owned businesses get access to the information, to the resources um, through events and education programs. We created the R plus um, small business relief fund um, that granted close to $50,000 in micro grants to businesses in the city. Um, and we also created Resolve It in 30, which is an online um, 30 minutes or less uh, technical assistance webinars that we, um, we have been doing um, over time. And we pivoted a lot of our programming to focus on, um, on really recalibrating and, and helping businesses restart under the new economy. Awesome. Uh, Trish. Please share your thank example. You so, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so one of the things that we knew early on in the pandemic were that there was many known unknowns and that we had to act with imperfect information. Uh, we were guidelines, medical information, news and resources were constantly changing. Businesses were looking for guidance and there was very little tangible information that business owners could easily access. So I think there were Friday afternoon before the world shut down, we got a call from our local county council saying, we need to do something next week. We need to start to have conversations and information and get the information out to the business community. This was before I understood Zoom. Uh, so we had a, an online call, uh, not Zoom, with 7,000 people the Tuesday that the world shut down. Um, and that brought together everybody from federal, state, county and local officials trying to help the businesses understand what was happening and how we could continue to move forward, but not knowing what, you know, what to expect. So that was the first thing we did. And then the Delaware County Chamber team worked tirelessly to make every step of the information that had been changing easy to understand and implement. We utilized our partnerships and brought in leaders and experts from every aspect of this change to directly answer questions for the business owners. When it seemed like our, our members were burning out and losing hope, we created programming to keep folks energized, engaged, and motivated, no matter what their industry was, because there was a few months there that I kept hearing the words hope, hope from so many business owners, so many people in the community, and we realized that people were starting to lose it because there was just, it, it seemed like there was no end in sight. So throughout that, that one year that March of 2020 to March of 2021, uh, we hosted 97 virtual events. We assisted more than 2000 businesses through their pandemic relief efforts. We tracked and advocated for 937 legislative bills. We distributed um, 2,250 PPE kits to local businesses. And we created a shop Delco map for our members uh, in the Delaware County community to see where they could support local. So folks, as we were talking about dining, it, you know, not knowing where we could eat, where we could go, we created a map so people could just go and see what was near them, what was around them, and how they could support their local community. But most importantly, the pandemic, as we know, it uncovered so many disparities. So one of the most important things and things that we're most proud of that we created from the, the pandemic is this Business Economic and Equity Committee, which is why we're here today. And through the leadership of Vince Gordon has really shown a light on, on what needs to be done in our community and in our region and, and in our country to make sure that there are um, there's a level playing field for everybody and then we all have the access to the things that we need. Awesome. So in the beginning, I talked about fierce advocates and strategists and, you know, the answers we just heard just really highlight uh, the importance of that in the work that's being done. Also just highlights what's possible, right? You know, just some of the ideas that came forward. People didn't give up. Like you said, they had hope and creativity, um, which made an amazing difference. Um, in the next question, I'd love to hear about, you know, what is going on now? What's going on in terms of the current status and frame of mind of the business leaders that you're working with as we continue to work to emerge from this pandemic? Let's begin with Jennifer. Well, that is a very, very important question and one that, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, sort of keeps me a little bit, you know, up at night. Um, we, I've seen or we've experienced that there's the reality of Zoom fatigue. 
And so a lot of the programming that we do that has moved online, uh, people are because you know it's it, people are harder to get these days. The the, um, the the proliferation of online activity um, is really really um, exhausting for a lot of individuals. We are concerned about uh, businesses or entrepreneurs that are just so um, overwhelmed that they're just not paying attention. So a lot of what we're doing is really literally just calling them, making sure they're engaged. Um, and making sure they're taking advantage of the opportunities that are available. And so one of the things that we're doing, we, we are moving more into programming and evidence-based uh, education programs that will really yield the outcomes that will transform the, uh, the, the, the businesses that we work with. Um, so we have a couple of programs that we are doing. One is called Accelerate Latinx. It's a seven month intensive education program, um, an accelerator, if you will. Uh, that is actually, we're doing it in person because we believe that we need to re-engage with our community uh, and get, pe get people out of their homes and their offices. The second one, we're piloting a construction industry program. Um, one of the things that we did during the, this pandemic was take a deep dive into analyzing really the makeup of entrepreneurs in the Latino community in the region. And what we found is that close to 80% of the businesses in our region are either on the commercial corridor type of business, which is this business to consumer, or they are in the construction and allied industries. So we have partnered with Surety Bond Associates um, to launch a Spanish language construction capacity building program that is a 12 session program that begins in October. So we have been really busy uh, doing outreach and really developing the programming that will ultimately make a real difference in the scaling of Latino owned businesses. Thank you. Trish, what would you share in terms of what's going on now with the business leaders with whom you work? There's a lot. Um, and because we have such a diverse membership uh, in terms of size, um, we are really trying to find that balance. We're seeing that regardless of size of business, that leadership matters. And many of our business owners are, are now leading with empathy. Um, the employee's emotional well-being is more important than immediate financial gains, as we're all seeing it's so hard to find uh, good workers to, to show up every day and, and help to keep your operations open. So it's been very important to kind of find that balance and because what is in an organization if it's not your people, uh, those who work for you day in and day out. And I, I feel like we've heard that more, more often than we ever have is that that's so important to plan for those staffing challenges as well as um, supply chain issues, which many are face facing right now. But we're trying to find that balance as I, I keep saying that, trying to find the balance. Um, so the Zoom fatigue is so real, but we've also become so efficient with these Zoom meetings where uh, people enjoy that they can have a, a nine o'clock meeting and still have a 10, 15 meeting and not have to worry about that travel time. So we're trying to embrace that so we can get our largest uh, corporations and our, our leaders of those businesses to be more engaged with the chamber, which, is, has, which has been a benefit over the past 18 months. And we're also you know, realizing that our small business owners who haven't been able to come out in person are now enjoying the um, relationships that they can build through mindful and purposeful networking on Zoom, where we're matching, we're having um, speed networking opportunities so folks can meet maybe 20 people in an hour and that you're not worried about, can I shake their hand? Do we fist bump? How do we say hello? So we're, we're trying to offer those opportunities but it is so real. We are people, people. We need to be face to face. So we're, you know, having those events and, and bring people together in a safe way where they're comfortable and not, you know, not sure. They're very sure about how they can uh, attack these networking events, because th I think that's overwhelming now. It's something that we lost over that, these 18 months is, you know, we used to all walk in a room where we're, very, we're extroverts because this is our job. But now you're, people are more unsure of what's right, what's comfortable and what people are comfortable with. So I think finding that balance and, and making sure we have the opportunities for people still to build the relationships that will build their business, but at, at a pace that they're comfortable with. Thank you. 
And Regina, same question, please share. Sure, so one of the things that we're doing is we are challenging the status quo unapologetically, right? So we're making sure that as the economy is recovering, that minority businesses are not left behind, that the growth is inclusive. And so one of the biggest things that we did recently is we joined with all the diverse chambers in Philadelphia and we created the Diverse Chambers Coalition of Philadelphia to make sure we have a stronger voice to advocate for those very small businesses that have unique challenges that other businesses might not experience. So that's one of the things that we've done. We've created programming that's going to be innovative ways to remove some of the barriers and challenges that we've seen time and time again. One is access to capital. So we stood up the Coaching the Capital program. It's a one year program. We have five members that are going through the program currently and it's to make them not only bankable, but to actually be connected to capital at the end of the program. So we've partnered with WISFIS, we've partnered with New, Cap, uh, New Spring. They're actually analyzing the financial statements of our businesses, helping them to create a growth strategy Strategy that's not going to just keep them alive during the pandemic, but it's going to help them thrive once they come out of the pandemic. Um, innovative ways with supplier diversity chains, right? So we had uh, Pico sponsored a month of programming for us last, last month, Power Up with Pico. And we talked about how there is a need to create systems that may be different for minority businesses that is going to allow them to come into the supply chain. Creating opportunities in construction where we're breaking down the contracts. So other businesses have the opportunity to compete because there's a capacity issue. But if we're breaking down the contract and spreading it across different members that gives us an opportunity to have more people participate. We had a national convening of mayors where we brought in mayors from over the around the country who were doing particularly well in black business creation because we found Philadelphia particularly was low in that regard. And so having discussions and convening folks together to say how can we approve on creating a better ecosystem working with all the technical partners here in the region to make sure that we are moving diverse businesses forward, advancing them forward, doing whatever it is we need to do in order to do that, and working collectively in the same voice in order to do that. It's the collaboration that we see here. So when I came into this role back in January, I did a listening tour because I needed to know exactly from my members, our donors, our supporters, and our partners what they wanted to see. And the number one thing was collaboration across chambers across the region. And so we've been able to do that. Another thing that our members wanted to see, they wanted to see committees within our boards because they wanted more active participation. So we stood up five uh, committees where we look at incubation, we look at policy, we have a policy committee now. We have different committees that are able to provide advice and expertise in their area and their sector. So we make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind in this recovery, that we're touching all industry, that we're touching all small businesses and that we are all moving in the same direction. Thank you. What I heard in all the answers was uh, um, listening, responsiveness and action. You know, so great, great things happening. Next, let's talk a bit about kind of your role in terms of advocacy. You know, how are you working with state and federal legislators um, to ensure your businesses get what they need? Um, how do you keep your members abreast of the developments, what's changing? And any thoughts you might have about how relationships could be improved in terms of how you work with government officials. Um, so this time let's start with Trish. All right, thank you so much. So um, at the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce for almost 150 years, being an advocate for business has been our mission, but it changed um, greatly in March, 2020. Instead of us asking our elected officials, they were coming to us saying, what's changing? How can we help? And what can we do for the businesses? So we quickly 
pivoted and changed the way we approached our communication with the elected officials. And we began sending out emails to the elected officials, making it just as we were to our business owners, we were sending them to our elected officials on federal, state, local changes and policies and making it easy for them to understand so they could push that information out to their constituents. We didn't realize what the impact of that would be, just another email for the work that we've been doing, but um, it has created fantastic relationships for us and the business community here in Delaware County because now our elected officials understand what the roles are of, chamber of chambers of commerce and how important our small businesses are and how they can live. They, many have said that small businesses are important, but over those, these last 18 months, they've really realized the impact of all small, all businesses. And um, State Representative Joanna McClinton, is, she's just amazing, but it, the pandemic has helped to build a relationship that we have as the chamber with Joanna because she realized the impact that we have on small businesses and she really wanted to be a part of that and helping to make sure diverse businesses were aware and, and um, up to date on the things that were happening. So we really changed the way that we communicated with our elected officials and helped them so they could help their constituents. Um, and then in terms of our members, it, the reverse, letting them know what's happening at the, um, local, state, and federal levels. We have a government affairs committee that advocates for business issues. Um, but we really wanted to understand how our members were getting their information. And I'm sure Jennifer and Regina have, this, have the same challenges. I think it was Jennifer that says, we're calling people now to make sure that they know. So one of the things through the pandemic I kept asking was, how do you get your information? How do you get your news? And people weren't so quick to respond. I don't, I, sometimes I don't think they want to tell us how they get their news, but we've been trying to put information out on all of our social media channels and then utilizing the newspapers, you know, print media to make sure that we're reaching everybody, however they get their news, whether they wanna tell us how they get their news or not. Um, but we've just created the information and made it easy to access and understand both for our members and our elected officials. Um, and just the constant communication and collaboration and the education of relationship building with our newly elected officials, with our longtime elected officials, and those members that, that want to have that relationship. It really is just that constant communication that has helped through the, through the pandemic, and I, I believe will take us into the, the future, the possible. Awesome. Regina, please tell us about what work you've been doing in this area. Certainly. So one thing we knew was critical is sourcing all of the resource and information, especially during COVID with the regulations changing constantly, right? So we have over 10,000 followers on LinkedIn, then we have another four or 5,000 on uh, Facebook, and then it goes down when you get to Instagram. But then we have about 5,000 subscribers to our newsletter. So we leverage the power of our social media and our newsletter to get information out quickly about changing regulations. And we work with our, and I'll just start with the federal, our federal elected officials. We worked really close with them to get the boots on the ground information on how our businesses were impacted. Especially when you look at the PPP um, loans and at the beginning of that, small businesses were left out. So chambers and other advocates worked really closely with our elected officials to change the application process and not just change the application process, but actually create a window of opportunity where if you were under 20 employees, you had 14 days where only you could apply for the PPP funding. And so that advocacy actually changed the process that allowed that government relief funding to get down to the members. When we look at our our state officials, it even went a step further. So they understood the micro businesses still weren't getting the relief that they needed. So they set aside $20 million. Um, it was uh, Minority Appropriations Chair Vincent Hughes who made sure that they were pushing to get that money in the form of grants first to the uh, hair salons and barbershops. And then there was another 
uh, I think it was 250 set aside for the businesses that applied in the first wave that did not get that money. So they made sure there was direct investment, direct impact made to our members. And all of that happened through communication with our elected officials, our policymakers, in order to ensure that our members was getting what they needed. And that's through information too. And so we have Reset, Reimagine, and Reinvest for Sustainable Future Programming, where we have an influencer come every month to talk to our members, but they're not just talking at them. So when you register, we make sure that you have to fill out a survey to ask the question that you want to ask, and then we follow up. And then, so it's a two-way conversation and it's consistent in order for everyone to be on board, what's going on, they have the information quickly so they can make the decisions that they need. We invested in a public affairs firm. There was no way that we could get the message out ourselves. So we knew we had to make that investment. And from that, we've had four op-eds published, given our opinion and prescription on how we think things should happen. Um, and as Jennifer will tell you, I'm sure, is we make sure that we're testifying on bills that come before city council to make sure it is something that is going to be conducive to our members' environment for doing business. Yes. Um, I, I love the part about reinvesting, right? Now, that was the time to do more, to lean in so that business is benefited. Um, Jennifer, please share what work you did with federal oh. or local legislators. Uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of testifying in front of city council to make sure that streeteries are available, that restaurants have uh, the resources that they need and the flexibility that they need in order to operate. That's such an important uh, segment of our of our membership. Um, we've worked, uh, been working really diligently with government locally to uh, monitor and improve participation of minority businesses, diverse businesses in contracting opportunities. But one of the things that I think has really been fantastic is a collaboration between the diverse chambers in Philadelphia, which has concluded, you know, has formalized into the into the coalition that Regina mentioned. Uh, we meet on at least on a monthly basis to really look over the, 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 the environment in, in the region and to find points of alignment so that we at, can advocate. And in fact, um, we have jointly conducted two surveys of small business owners. Um, and these surveys have been presented um, publicly so that we can be truly the voice of small businesses in, in, in the region. Um, and um, at the federal state level and in sort of more macro um, levels, I do sit on the board of directors of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which re and I work really closely with the government and policy committee um, that provides um, me um, and our chamber a real advantage in knowing what is going down in Washington, D.C., behind closed doors, uh, help um, you know, we help advocate and, and as Regina mentioned, this idea of uh, when the public, when the federal relief programs when be, were being formed, making sure that, uh, that advocacy on how our small businesses could take advantage of these programs, what was working, what was not working, advocating for CDFI funding, advocating for 501c6 funding for the chambers. If you recall the chambers, the 501c6 chambers uh, were not able to take advantage of the PPP until you know, significantly late in the in the process. So these are all um, sort of conversations that we've been having back and forth through the channels. Um, but I think this idea of collaborating, of bringing um, the diversity uh, all together under one voice is probably the, the what I think uh, the initiative that I think has really, really long-term uh, potential here. Great answers, a lot of information shared um, and good memories, like uh, all the details of the things that happened um, at the macro and micro level. So in many of your answers, you've talked about or mentioned various partners. Are there any partners or constituents that are important to your work that you didn't mention that you would like to highlight? Let's begin with Regina. 
I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, certainly. I would say our members, right? Our small businesses, they are super important partners in this because it's it's their voice that we're amplifying. So in order to do that, we have to have engagement both ways, the engagement with our members and their engagement with us. One thing that we did do that I didn't mention is we launched a new website and that gives our members the opportunity to connect to each other and to connect to us better. And that way we're making sure that we're always promoting their voice. And so that is a partner that is super important in the work that I do. Thank you. Jennifer. So we haven't, so I haven't really mentioned the corporations and the foundations that um, have supported us throughout um, really this past couple of years. Um, it has been uh, very difficult. And um, we it, oftentimes, as Ramiro Cavazos of the USCC says that uh, chambers of local chambers of commerce are the emergency room for small businesses, right? Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes in philanthropy, the role of chambers of commerce and the role of entrepreneurship um, really was bypassed. It was not really looked at as a real solution for wealth creation, for really jumpstarting the economy. And I think over the last um, 18 months or so, the conversations with philanthropy have really drastically change and I think the importance of small business development and entrepreneurship is much better understood um, so and there are partners that have really come forward in ways that uh, were frankly unexpected for us and so those those that that have um, helped sustain the chamber over this period the, these are partners that we really um, I'm sure all of us um, have a lot to be grateful for thank you We'll close out this question with Trish. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I haven't mentioned the our board members for the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce, as well as our foundation for the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are a small staff at the chamber, but we have very impactful board members. And throughout all of this, and, and as we go into the future, our board members have shared their resources from these large corporations, which has allowed us to share the latest and most up-to-date and easy to understand information with our smaller businesses. And, and that has had such a tremendous impact with these very busy and very influential uh, heads of corporations sharing that information that they have their HR teams and their, their other teams researching daily that we can share with our small business members to make things easy for them and kind of cut through the red tape that has been so impactful um, to others that might not have access to that and um, with our board members and their um, influence in our chamber and Vince Gordon who's the chair of this committee without Vince we wouldn't have this event today we wouldn't have this business economic and equity committee making sure that the small and diverse businesses here in Delaware County are being heard, are being reached, and are being invited to be part of the conversation in ways that we never could have imagined before. So that is definitely something that we are grateful for, and we are looking forward to continuing to build those relationships. Thank you. Pivoting, investing, um, collaborating, great themes for success. So let's shift to a business perspective. Is there a, a business with whom you worked that did a great job dealing with the challenges? Because I, I heard about all the wonderful ways in which you all provided resources. Um, sometimes people remember the stories, you know, that happened from a business perspective. They can believe it and feel it because they were in that same boat. Um, I'll start with Jennifer. Sure. Um, I think in many ways, uh, businesses have really pivoted and, and become really creative. And in the Latino community, there's a lot of resiliency to be very proud of. Um, we have one particular business that comes to mind when we talk about who has been able to really um, transform their business significantly. And I think of one of our Accelerate Latinx alumna. Her name is Sofia de Leon. She is a young um, entrepreneur with a, a restaurant 
that used to be catering to the lunch sector, um, <clears throat> the lunch crowd in Center City called El Mercury. She's part of Dine Latino Restaurant Week, so Central American food. Um, you know, during you know during normal times, she would be a really great place where restaurant uh, the uh, the the workforce in downtown Center City would just go and that she could live off of lunch crowd alone, right? And she was doing some corporate catering, of course, pandemic comes, all of that comes to a close and she suffered significantly and greatly. Um, but, you know, she, uh, you know, she took the tools that she learned in our Accelerate Latinx program and she has actually um, grown her business over the last uh, 18, 20 months. She has opened a second location in the Reading Terminal. Um, she has really, uh, her, her um, catering has just expanded. So she was <clears throat> selected as uh, one of the caterers that would cater to the health workers and, and other folks uh, during the pandemic. Um, she is uh, really working at importing coffee um, and creating just a really fantastic um, enterprise out of a really, really difficult period of time. But I think the one thing about that I want to say about her is, and to other small businesses in the audience, is that this was not just um, by chance. It was not a fluke. Um, she went through a rigorous business education program that prepared her to have the strategic mindset so that she could make the decisions that would make her successful even in the most difficult of times. And in fact, that program that we did, none of the businesses that went through it have closed. And in fact, um, we have created or retained 88 business out of 15, um, and, uh, 15 entrepreneurs that participated. Oh my goodness, that gave me goosebumps. What a great story, you know, doubling in size, right? Um, as a result, that's amazing. Trish, please share. So I want to share about a business that really helped the chamber as well as themselves, but it was a CPA firm. So in the early days of PPP and the, the idle loans and understanding all of the things that were happening with the SBA, we as a chamber were needed to get that information out, but we are not accountants. We do not understand money. So we really needed to understand it. So we reached out to a CPA firm, a local CPA firm, um, Brinker Simpson, who partnered with us to, to put on webinars for our small business owners. They were not their clients. We probably had over a thousand small businesses tune into these webinars that we were doing so we could share the information with everybody so they could access the, the things that they needed. And they, rather, regardless of being clients or not, they would answer their questions one at a time so they knew how they could reach out and get that money that they deserved and that they needed to continue to operate. Um, so I really highlighting that as well as um, the chamber, my, my team has done a fantastic job in, in pivoting because as we were so used to doing in-person events and how we've kind of changed to do these, um, these type of events and bring it to our members and make sure that we're dealing with the challenges of the pandemic and setting new trends for the future. So kind of learning what works, going through and learning what doesn't work and, and bringing that to our members, I feel like is so important because it helps them kind of cut through all that stuff that they don't have to deal with themselves and we can really give that to them um, so they can make their jobs and their businesses grow. Great. And Regina, please share about a business success. Sure. So this one is quite personal and close to home. Um, so at the Chamber, we pride ourselves on procuring services from members. So we have a member, Felicia Harris, and her company is High Touch Enterprises. And she has been the marketing consultant for our annual meeting for maybe the last four years. So during COVID, um, she gave birth to her first child, I think it was January. And when March happened, she had to lay off all of her staff that she had bought in to cover while she was on maternity leave. And in order to keep her business afloat, she had to take on those clients while battling postpartum depression. But she, as women do, she, she had to keep her business going and she took that on and she did that. I came in as president in January 
of this year and quickly found myself myself without staff for various reasons. And my board stepped up, the foundation stepped up and they provided the capacity for me to have capacity for the chamber. And so I brought her on with the retainer. So she was really my only staff person as the consultant um, for at least six months before we were able to hire someone. And she was instrumental in making sure that nothing ceased. We were constantly getting information out to our members and we were constantly setting up program and she was executing on my vision. And from that, more clients started to come, more clients, more clients. And she also launched Ginger Tea during this time as well. So she has a retail tea business that is doing quite well. And then as the months went on, the city of Philadelphia decided they were gonna have a vendor opportunity at Love Park. So they asked their various partners to make suggestions, referrals for someone who could manage that opportunity. Well, I sent her name over and she was chosen well, she partnered with another small business in order to be able to manage that project, and now they have joined forces, and so they are a new organization, a new firm, which allows them to take on even more clients. So someone who, at the beginning of panic, uh, pandemic, was battling with postpartum depression, but still had to keep her business going, to someone who probably has grown 100% since the early days of the pandemic. And as Jennifer said, and as Trish said, that's from being prepared. She has been a chamber member for years. She has ingested the information that has been given for years. And so she was prepared to pivot and she was prepared to dig in and to be able to grow her business even in these uncertain conditions. Thank you. Great real business stories that just speak to the resilience and the importance of your work. Um, let's step back a bit and look out on that second or third horizon. What do you see in terms of the future of business? What will it look like, Trish? So I, I think uh, it just takes some practice and observation, a reassessment of who the customer is and a change in the way that we find connections. But I think this, the way what we see the future of business to look like can be a good thing for small business and entrepreneurs. Uh, small businesses can make decisions more collaboratively uh, and is a, a different approach that maybe a larger corporation might have to take when making changes and decisions where we can uh, make them almost instantaneously and, and kind of um, adapt quickly and cater to our employees and their needs. So I, I really think that um, we need to ensure and require inclusivity across the workforce. But I think the future of business looks much more inclusive. And I really see a, um, a, a, great, a great outlook for our smaller and more diverse businesses because people are aware, they're not afraid to have the conversations of what needs to be done to make inclusivity happen. And I, I really see the future is bright for um, all of our small businesses and larger corporations that will benefit from the growth in the region. Thank you. Regina, what do you see? I see definitely inclusivity. I see nimbleness, adaptability. And I see for us, it's our small businesses um, not trying to do it on their own collaborating with others, joining in. One of the studies shows, um, and I forget this morning which study that was, but there's a study um, regarding black businesses, especially during the ideation phase, um, when they're deciding if, if it's a good idea, should I do it? And usually they don't have anyone to talk to about these ideas and sort of get advice from. And so I think from, um, the pandemic and where we were growing to more businesses will be collective in how they get their information and in being um, getting how they get their advice. We have a program, peership program with the uh, Four Seasons in Philadelphia, where we pair business owners with mentors in the organization in order to talk about these things, right? And so I think when we look at the future of businesses, we're gonna see stronger businesses because now they know there's a collectiveness that they can pull on in order to do that. And I think we're gonna see businesses that are prepared 
prepared more so for crises um, in the future. Thank you. Jennifer, what do you see in the future? So I think we have uh, created some really strong foundation over the last year. I think the, 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 the trauma and the, and the um, urgent nature of COVID-19 has really awakened um, a lot of urgency, a sense of urgency in all of us. And so on the one hand, at the macro level, this relationship with other chambers, this advocacy work that we have just in many ways escalated and accelerated, um, I see that continuing and really relationships with Regina and other chambers, for example, in, in, in elements small and large. I mean, we're collaborating at very minute level, but then also at much larger scale, we'll, reap, you know, we'll really have benefits for, for our community at large. On the small business side, um, we are being much more acute in the work that we do, much more value-driven and outcome-driven. And these programs that we have implemented um, you know, and getting the word out uh, that businesses that survive and thrive under these difficult circumstances are not doing it by chance, they're doing it because they're prepared and ensuring that those resources um, and education opportunities um, are increasingly available for those entrepreneurs that want to want to take advantage of them. Um, so I think that's really where we are channeling a lot of the energy in our organization. Thank you. I'm gonna combine the next two questions because I, I think they tie together. So here goes. So I wanna hear from you about some of the projects, initiatives that you're working on to help keep moving businesses forward. And what are you encountering as some of the biggest roadblocks. I'm going to start with you, Regina. Sure. So I think we've probably talked about just about all of the things that we're doing. Um, however, we are continuing to make sure that we're removing barriers for our businesses. Um, that's what we're laser focused on and doing it really in a systemic way, advocating for larger policies that are going to be inclusive of small businesses. One of the things that um, Philadelphia is doing is looking at the tax code and how that affects small businesses. And so one of the things that was missing from that was the voices of diverse businesses, um, the, the chamber leaders. So making sure that we're continuing to make our voices heard, to advocate that our businesses voice or belong in the room. Um, when people say we're going to have inclusive growth, holding them accountable to that inclusive growth by making sure we're there to see that that happens, representing their voices. Um, we have a lot of programming to address other barriers that businesses face, like access to capital, access to information, access to knowledge. Um, and, and I want to just mention, um, Karen and I are actually in the program, um, the Amer Health Caritas Protege mentorship program where I'm her mentor and we share information about how businesses need to align for their services and how they can become more acquainted with our businesses. So it's continued partnerships and communication um, that we are engaging in to move our businesses forward. Thank you. Jennifer. So, you know, I've spoken a lot about the work that we're doing and where, you know, where the, the chamber is headed in terms of challenges, of course, um, educating and putting programs together that are high quality require a lot of funding. Uh, we make these programs uh, available at no cost to chamber members, yet these are thousands of dollars that we are investing per each participant. And so really uh, getting the partnerships, getting the funding, that is always when you're trying to do this kind of work, um, that generally is the main challenge. And so, you know, we continue to do that because we want these programs to be available, you know, in the long term. So I'm gonna do a follow on if I may about something that you said earlier regarding philanthropy. What will it take for philanthropy to dive in even more to support small businesses? Because as we know, um, small businesses are like that backbone of the community. They are giving people their first jobs. You know, they 
create a lot of economic stability and jobs. So what would it take to get philanthropy more on board? Well, I think a lot of it is education. I think philanthropy has looked at small business as something you know where people are making a lot of money and why are we supporting rich people? But the reality is that the disparities that we see in education and in income and wealth on the individual and household level, you also see them at the small business level. And I think that's something that philanthropy for many, many years just did not realize and are becoming more aware of. Um, I think it's people like us that need to uh, hold philanthropy accountable for for wealth creation and for providing opportunities uh, for equitable development of small businesses in um, diverse communities. Thank you. Trish. Thank you. Um, so we're constantly asking for feedback from our members and business owners in the community, knowing their challenges as well as their successes is key to keeping businesses moving forward in the region. I mean, these past 18 months have really given us an opportunity to listen, reflect, and implement. Uh, but I'm so glad Jennifer actually talked about the funding of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we try to do uh, as, as much as we can for as little as possible. Um, because we want to make sure that all of our businesses have access to all of these programs with um, in a way that they can afford and, the, and in a way that is realistic, but we also know that time and, and energy and, and money goes into these programs. So I think that's one of um, the biggest roadblocks in is to building these programs is to doing that and being mindful that we're membership and sponsorship based organizations. But we have to put that aside kind of that's what keeps me up at night because really we need to focus on the mission of our chambers and that is to um, create advocacy and education and opportunity for all of our businesses so i feel like as we move forward and and as we've all said we need we're listening to what our members need and we're really taking the time to implement and put those programs into place to create a more inclusive environment as we move forward thank you all right, we're coming to the home stretch here. So um, when you think about all that you've stated in terms of how you've worked with businesses, how you've pivoted, changed, invested, uh, been very creative and advocated, what do you think are some of the best opportunities going forward, right, to get even better and stronger in terms of collaboration in the future? I'll start with Jennifer. Um, I think uh, technology has really uh, lowered the barriers for collaboration. I think one of the things that we can do now, look at what we're doing. Uh, we are all here really having a meaningful conversation about the future, the present and the past of, of the economy. Um, in, in, in this case, we're collaborating with you in, we have not done that before, right? Um, so I think really um, uh, using technology to the best, that the, the best I can technology can do is lower barriers and bring people together. Um, I think, you know, as Regina would say, but we have to hold each other accountable and we have to, once we make this collaborations, really what is, what is it that we're looking to do and hold ourselves and others accountable for what we said we were going to do. Um, so not just letting the barriers come down, but really, um, you know, holding each other accountable for the outcomes we want to see. Uh, the A word, accountability, very important to making things happen. Uh, Trish. The, I think the best opportunity for the Delaware County Chamber of Commerce for collaboration in the future is working with Regina and Jennifer and bringing their members uh, to our members. So it, the accountability is there and can happen. And I'm gonna steal Vince Gordon's line of inclusive capitalism. That is the best opportunity for collaboration in the future is to make sure that everybody's given the opportunity that they need to be successful and, and work together to build the region that we can. Thank you. Regina, you get the last word on this question. <laughs> Certainly. So I think the best opportunity for us to continue to work collaboratively is to leverage the commitment. The commitment is there. We are all committed to making sure all businesses that are stood up, that they're going to survive and not just survive, but they're going to actually thrive. So being committed to the work, continuing to do the hard work, continuing to work together um, to align on 
initiatives and advocacy that's available for us to do so. And just to be a sounding board on things that are not. I can pick up the phone, I imagine, and call Trish now if I have a question about something or need a resource. I definitely know I can do that with Jennifer. I can do that with most of the chambers around, around the region because we've actually had a conversation we've met. There's no competitiveness. There's only collaboration because we're all working for the same thing to make sure that small businesses in this area have the resources that they need and they have the tools that they need and that they are here to be the beacons of our communities that they currently are. Thank you. But before I turn to Vince, I'll just do a quick recap. I'm a big fan of word clouds, you know, like you just see all these things. So here's my word cloud of what I heard from these amazing leaders. I heard collaborate, reinvest, pivot, heard, heard hope and optimism in some of the examples and stories, resilience, uh, nimbleness, um, accountability, communication, like all the time, every channel, right? Um, and up and down and across and between, uh, partnership and preparedness. So I am so thankful for the time that you've spent in answering these questions, telling us so much valuable information um, so that we're stronger in our businesses and stronger in our communities. With much gratitude for each of you and the work that you do. I'll turn to Vince. Erin, thank you very much. And, and all I can say is, uh, wow. You know, I, I, I just uh, listened to four uh, executives, four leaders, for transformers, um, you know, I think the business community in the uh, in the Delaware Valley region is in is in very good hands uh, with advocates such as Regina, Trish, and Jennifer. So uh, thank thank all of you uh, for participating today. I, I want to also thank our sponsor Boeing for their commitment. I know we we talked about the importance of philanthropy and sponsorship, and and Boeing certainly at least uh, here in Delaware County has always uh, been a tremendous supporter and sponsor and booster of the, of the Delco Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, my committee members. You know, I, I chair this committee and I have the, I have the, the, uh, the privilege of chairing uh, this committee, but I, I serve uh, with uh, uh, as equally committed uh, committee members and many of them were able to participate today um, on this, on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom. So thank you to my committee members and also thank you to the, to the board uh, of directors uh, at the Delco Chamber. I also uh, want, want to um, uh, thank um, the, uh, the, the, the presidents, uh, Regina, uh, Trish and, and Jennifer. Um, you know, I, I am at, in awe of, your, of the work that you do. Uh, I also wanna thank you for being so receptive to this idea of coming together and sharing, and, and I think, I don't know who said it, but maybe it was you, Regina, you know, this, we're about collaboration, not competition. Uh, yes, we all wanna grow our membership base, but uh, I think we know that um, uh, the work that you all discussed today is was so extremely important. And last, you know, I, I certainly wanna thank you, Karen. Um, you know, I, I started out earlier by saying, Karen and I are, are both, um, well, I, I'm a, um, uh, an alum of AmeriHealth Caritas. Karen is still a leader uh, there within the AmeriTas Caritas family of, of, of companies. And um, she is certainly reflective of the, the other market presidents and, and executive leadership at Caritas and their commitment to small, diverse businesses. Um, and, and Karen, you did a wonderful job today. Um, as I said, I like to have this become a series and you are more than welcome uh, to come back and, and host uh, future panel discussions. You, you did a great job. And if we could applaud, I would applaud. So I just want to thank you for your giving up of your time. Because uh, as I shared earlier, you, you, you wear several hats. Uh, uh, one includes you know, running a managed care plan in our nation's capital. So, and I must say a very successful plan as well. Um, so thank all of you, Jennifer, Trish, Regina. Thank all of the participants who, who uh, who uh, dialed in today, and uh, let's uh, let's continue this collaboration. I I I'm so excited, and thank you. Thank you. Great.